If you are a first time visitor or recently new worshiping with us, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome everyone here today. But if you are new, we'd love to get a name, an email, a phone number, something. If you want to stop by our welcome center on your way out, out those doors and to the right, you'll see a smiling face back there to get some information from you. We'd just like to get to know you better and thank you for worshiping with us. How many of you like peace and quiet? How many of you are parents and don't remember what peace and quiet is? <laughs> Uh, some folks, I think, really like peace and quiet. They like their quiet place where they can shut off the world. Some people, I think, like to have that little bit of chaos going on around them. When I was little, I had a sandbox out in the backyard, um, and my mom did uh, child care out of the home, and so every day after lunch when it was nap time, and I was too big for naps, although I regret ever becoming too big for naps at this point, uh, but I got sent outside. Uh, apparently, I wasn't very good at the whole stay quiet bit. Um, so I'd go out in the sandbox for hours and hours, and I'd sit there and I'd just play. I, I made castles, I made pyramids, most of all I made a mess. Uh, I tried to make a race car one time, you know, I dug out a tunnel for my, my legs to sit in, dug all the way to the bottom where I was hitting dirt again, and tried to smooth that out, couldn't figure out a steering wheel. One time I tried to make a sandwich, not like the peanut butter and jelly I'd had for lunch with like stuff oozing out the sides, but like, like a Wicked Witch of the West sand witch. Uh, and it was going well, but I couldn't figure out how to do the brim of the hat in the sandbox. But those days for me were, were peaceful. They were carefree. That was around the time, though, in my carefree time, I didn't know that in the world around me, when I had no cares, that our President Reagan was meeting with the leaders of Russia to try to defuse situations. I didn't know as I sat there trying to shape castles in the sandbox free of worry that Chernobyl had just happened. I remember a time of calm and joy and peace, sitting in, in my basement room with an old small black and white TV, you know, with the aluminum foil everywhere and the antennas, and if someone upstairs walked the wrong direction, I lost it, and, and trying to watch a basketball game, and I was excited because the Rockets were winning, and then it got interrupted. In, in my peaceful, joyful time when things were going well, it got interrupted to let us know that the U.S. was at war in the Gulf. Palm Sunday, the, the disciples were excited. They were joyful and peaceful as Jesus rode in triumphantly, thinking this is it. You know, we've been waiting on him to come in and triumph and take over and, and sit on the throne as a king. And, and this time, they just, that's it. That's what they were waiting for, but they didn't know what was coming in the next week. We can all think of times in our lives and through history where we've been pretty happy with life, pretty peaceful. Things might have been pretty good for us when then suddenly something unexpected happened something that we may not have ne even known was a growing conflict or issue. It seems like the world around us is full of conflict. All around us is the possibility of chaos just ready to be tipped off at any moment. Today we're going to look at the last half of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we're going to talk about peace. There's a Hebrew word for peace, and it's up on the board, shalom. Shalom means peace. It's mentioned in the Bible about 428 times throughout the Old and New Testament and it communicates an absence of hostility. It communicates success, health. It communicates deliverance and salvation. Let's pray together and then we'll take a look at what the scriptures have to say today. God, thank you so much that we can come together. I pray you bless our time in your word. Help us to come with a fresh mind and each time we open up the Bible to gain new understanding and new insights and see how your word is the same as it ever was, but has a new meaning for our lives today. Be with us, God, as we, we look at this letter that Paul wrote, as we look at the peace that he speaks of and, and how we can live in peace and shalom with the world around us while striving to always be better and bring glory to you. Thank you most of all for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we'll start with verse 26 through 33. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two, or at the most three, and each in turn, and one must interpret. If there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. 
as I started looking at this passage, I, I was worried about how to approach it. I wondered what application I can take out of this for us today. How, what am I supposed to say about this particular passage? This isn't really how our church works. This isn't how our culture works. I worried about how to connect their culture and their church to our culture and our church. But then as I read the passage over and over, I began to understand a little something else. This week started with verse 26. What is the outcome then, brethren? And when I looked at that, we need to know what we're looking at if we need to understand the outcome. And so to move forward, we have to step back. So if we step back a couple verses, in verse 24, we read, But if all prophecy, all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he's convicted by all. He's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So if we all work to just simply speak God's word into the lives of one another when we join together, and into the lives of the other guy, the people that we come across every day in our lives outside these walls, when we can be and should be at our best in our calling of what the church is called to be, then the outcome is where we started today. When you assemble, each one has a psalm. Each one has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If we're telling the world about Jesus with our, our words and with our lives, first of all, we're living at peace. This is the joy that comes in being a follower of Christ. And secondly, when we come together, each one of us has a song we can sing. In Psalms chapter 40, the third verse, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Each one of us has a teaching when we come together. If we've been going out to the world like we're supposed to be and sharing God's message with them, each of us can share something that God has shown us this week. Each of us can share something among the group here that God has done for us or helped us through. Each of us can share something that God has done through us this week through just being obedient. And that's such an encouragement when we come together and we can share and, and maybe I've had a bad week, but you've had a great week and maybe I've been really disobedient to what God's called me to and you've been really obedient and that's an encouragement to me to step up and do better this week. It helps the rest of us get back out there fired up and ready to go. Each one of us has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation, and in all the things we do, all the things we just said, all of us have something to bring to the table when we come together here as the church in this building. And all of those things are done for edification, to build up and encourage the body. Well, Paul goes on, and down in verse 29, he says, when we share, the others who are assembled are to pass judgment, to make sure that we're edifying the body, to make sure that we, at our very base level, are teaching God's goodness and teaching what the Bible says solidly. Paul tells us back in chapter 5 that we're not supposed to judge the outside world, but we're absolutely supposed to judge one another. We've got to be accountable to one another. So if someone comes in and they say, we're following God's spirit, and they give us a message, are we just to assume that they're accurate and they're truthful and we should listen to them? Well, not according to what Paul says here. And if we go back even further, lo looking in Acts, he was on his way to Jerusalem, and he had stopped, he left Ephesus on his way, and he stopped in Cyprus for a week along the way, and in Acts chapter 21, verse 4, he says, after looking up the disciples, we stayed for seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. But then Agabus shows up, and we, we remember Agabus from chapter 11, maybe you remember, maybe you don't, but he showed up in chapter 11 of Acts. Paul's continuing on his way to Jerusalem, he left um, Cyprus, and he headed on and stopped in Caesarea and stayed with Philip. Philip was an evangelist who had four daughters who were prophetesses. And Agabus comes in just like he, in, in chapter 11, he came and he told them about a famine that was going to happen, and then it happened. So Agabus already has some credibility. And then here in 21, Paul's traveling on after the church had told him, don't go to Jerusalem. Agabus steps up. And in chapter 21, he says, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. Now, did you see what happened there? The first group, they didn't want Paul to die. They weren't necessarily wrong. They simply interpreted his potential death as a warning to not go. 
Agabus gives us a, a more clear message from the Holy Spirit. And Paul shares that this news of his potential death doesn't deter him. Paul went on to do just what God had called him to do. But do you see how easy it is for us to taint God's message with our own desires? How easy it is to twist it to get what we want from God's word. We have to be held accountable to one another, to look into the scriptures at what is actually said, to look at the context, to look at the culture, to look at the, what's going on in society around them and look at what, what's being said for that church and what that means for us today. We have to work to stick to what the Bible actually says. It's fine to give our opinions, but our opinions aren't necessarily God's word. We have to focus our efforts on reaching the lost. We come together and we're edified, we're encouraged together, but we have to focus our efforts on reaching the lost and welcoming people who don't know Jesus into the church. And welcoming people into the church, that means we welcome them into our lives. Because the church isn't just the building, the church is the people. We're called to love God more than everything. We're called to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we do this all in love, in peace, shalom. The absence of hostility is how we're supposed to function. This shalom, this peace, this message we take out, it's about deliverance, it's about salvation, and that's how we live our lives. Verse 33, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. With that said, let's read on, verses 34, 35, and 36. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come only to you? It's one of those parts where I'm glad that there's something solid here in front of me so I can duck when people start throwing things. This is where I could get myself in some serious trouble. First of all, there's no law in the Old Testament or the New for that matter that flat out tells all women not to speak whatsoever in church. That, that's kind of contradictory to everything else we see in the Bible, right? That kind of exclusiveness and man party idea of church just doesn't line up with the rest of Scripture. We do see in the Bible that wives are to submit to their husbands. Husbands are to love their wives like Christ loves the church. There are always both sides of that. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, we read, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And down in verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. This isn't a domineering, overbearing relationship that we see. What we do have in Corinth, though, and in the church today, are plenty of opportunities for division. We've talked for a few weeks now as we've gone through Paul's letter to the church in Corinth about unity. We've talked about love. We've talked about edifying, building up the church, one body, many parts, and doing that with everything that you do. So what is this passage really saying? Why is it here? It kind of seems out of place. If Paul's talking about unity and he's talking about authority after this and then he throws in this little section, is it just to trip preachers up and get us in trouble? Paul's talking about peace. When Paul is addressing the women, he's asking the married women to be subject to their husbands. He isn't asking every woman to be subject to every man. That's not what Paul talks about anywhere else in any of his letters when he addresses women. Also keep in mind when Paul says in church, he just had described everything about what in church means. The folks, the men and women, are sharing psalms, teachings, revelations, tongues, and they're discerning whether or not the people who are sharing are truly in God's spirit or if they're simply trying to gain prestige in the fellowship. If I'm up here teaching and Amy suddenly doesn't like the fact that I'm telling women to sit down and be quiet in church and she stands up and starts hollering at me in the middle of the message, that's not going to bring much peace to, to this time of the service. If I'm praying at the end of service and Amy decides that she's going to sing a song and, and I don't know about it and Micah doesn't know about it, she just starts belting out a tune of whatever song she wants to sing. She sings great, that's beautiful, but it's not going to bring any joy to the service. If she has a question about Micah's communion meditation and, and she's sitting in the back and I'm sitting in the front and she hollers up at me about what, what he just said, is that really what the Bible teaches? That's not a good time for that question. She should wait till we get home and ask me those questions there. And even widows and even single women, there's an elder or a deacon or teacher who you can discuss things with so that we can keep order, so we can keep unity in the church and not cause that division, not cause that interruption, not cause chaos that'll take away from someone else's experience in the church. When I was 17-ish, I went to a, it was a CIY conference and, and our youth group was, was growing and doing great and we had this one friend that some others from a different school had brought in 
and she was an atheist. She didn't believe in God. She rationalized everything out. Her parents were atheists, highly intelligent, rationalized everything, science this, science that, and she would not believe in this Jesus. But she had a lot of fun, and she hung out with us, and she was going to this week-long camp. Well, everything was great. The day had been fabulous. She was having fun. The worship was really hitting home. And at one point in the service, we looked over and she sat down and started crying. And we're all getting excited because this is it. We've been working on this. We've been praying for this. Finally, the spirit got through to her and she's going to accept Jesus and she's going to be a new person. It's going to be so exciting. But then the speaker got up and, and started his message and, and it wasn't what she needed to hear. It interrupted that process she had. And I was so frustrated. He's a good speaker. I'd heard him before. I've known him since then great speaker but what he said there wasn't what she needed but for me to get up and holler at him right there as he was trying to teach because he interrupted what i wanted for this friend of mine wouldn't have brought joy it wouldn't have brought peace it would have been very shalomi in that moment that sermon wasn't what she needed others in that room responded to that message it was what they needed other decisions were made that day some really good stuff came from the message that he brought just not what I and the youth group with us wanted for our friend. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. There is order, there is a plan, there is authority. Let's read on the last few verses of this chapter, 37 through 40. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not Recognized. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. This is the easy part of this passage. What Paul writes to the church, what Paul writes to Corinth, this is what we need to pay attention to because Paul is authorized to write this. He's an apostle. He told us so in the very opening of this letter. His life also stands as a witness to the truth of this when he said, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, he introduces himself right there, and through all of his letters and all of his life that we know about, he backs that up. Paul's letters make up a majority of the New Testament. There's the Gospels, the account of Jesus' life, how he was born, how he lived, how he died and rose again. There's Luke's second letter that he wrote, what we call Acts. It talks about how the church got its start and really started booming and spreading across the globe. There are a few other letters mixed into the New Testament, but the bulk of that is where Paul signed his name, and that revelation that Paul had that he gave to those churches is still with us 2,000 years later. But if someone wants to twist the scripture to their own benefit, if someone wants to look through the Bible with a legalistic eye, if someone insists on hold, holding to a, a culturally specific decorum, how we do things, how we don't do things, what we do, what we say, in what order we do those things in this building, Paul says if anyone doesn't recognize the truth of what he writes, let him not recognize it. I usually use the New American Standard Version um, but here, I really like the way the King James Version uh, words this. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. We work to edify, to encourage, to build up, to love the church, one body with many parts. We've been saying this for weeks now. We work together to live in joy, to live in love, to live in peace, in shalom. One commentary I was reading had a, a really great way of, of Putting this concisely, it says the church should be a place to exude joy and life, but never to such a degree that outsiders are repelled or insiders are alienated from each other. We're talking about God's peace. We're talking about deliverance. We're talking about salvation. And if we can focus in on those things, when we do what we're called to do, we go out there to the other guy, we can make an impact for his kingdom. I don't want us to be a church who's caught up in the way my grandma taught me that church should be. I don't want to be a church that is exclusive or makes someone feel unwelcome when they walk through the doors. Our job is to love people, to teach what the scripture calls us to with the love of Christ, to give God's spirit the best opportunity in our context to help the people we know to know him and to make a decision to follow him. And then we work to help them know him better after they make that decision through the scriptures. What Jesus did, we're coming in Friday, Good Friday service, that's his death. Sunday we come to, to celebrate the resurrection. Resurrection Sunday, what he did for you, what he did for the world was scandalous. The life that he lived was tragic. It was reckless, but in all the best ways. We're gonna sing another song together and it's our decision song and my prayer is that, that we stop seeking chaos, that we can find that joy 
that comes in being a follower of Christ. We stop looking for problems and live at peace with the world around us as we try to give them what God's word calls them to. Maybe your decision today is that you just need some time of prayer to, to be more bold in how you go out. Maybe you need to make a decision to pray because you're just not doing very good at what God's called you to and you need to straighten your life up. It's a good decision to make today. Maybe you've never accepted that call for repentance and salvation. That's a good decision to make today, to throw away the old life, to repent of that, to make the decision to follow Christ, be baptized, and live a new life in him. And maybe your decision today is you're kind of wondering, you are a believer, but you don't have a church body that you're accountable to. Today's a good day to make that decision, to come up and let us know that you want to be the best man or woman of God that you can be. You need us to hold you up to that standard, to call you out when you step off track. Well, that's a good decision, and we need you to help us be the best church we can be. We're in the middle of several communities. We've got Leesburg, Mineola, Claremont, Groveland, Mascot, all these communities around us, and we need one body with many, many parts to reach out to those communities so that we can find those people who are lost. We, we find Christians and we share fellowship with them. That's great, but we're called to find those people who don't know Christ. We're called to find those people who don't have a life that acknowledges him as their savior, and we're called to introduce them to what the Bible has to say for them, to that good news that we find there. My prayer is that we'll leave the chaos behind and focus on that peace, that shalom of Christ, and to share that with the world around us. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, thank you for today. Thank you that we can come together here and we can look through your word. Help each one of us, God, to, to make changes in our life every day, to move closer to you, to do a better job at doing what you've called us to do. God, help us to boldly share the good news that we know to be true from the scriptures. Thank you so much that we have your word. Thank you so much that we have this fellowship here, this body of believers, and that we have fellowship across the globe, uh, people who are doing their best to follow you and share your love with all those people. Thank you most of all for